In December 2011, Farming Smarter held its annual conference and trade show at the Lethbridge Lodge Hotel, bringing together over 250 agricultural professionals and over 20 speakers. The conference served to educate members of the farming community on growing trends, opportunities, and issues facing today's agricultural industry. We now take you to the Farming Smarter Conference to view the presentation of our speakers. Morning, don't clap ahead of time. I'm really boring, so <laughs> you may not like this. Actually, what was interesting was the, uh, and everybody can hear in the back there, is that all right? It's too back, you guys okay? Perfect. Uh, the story Geraldine told about the uh, feedlot manager who, who married a vegan. Um, I, I did manage to marry a vegetarian. So uh, this is one of those little stories that comes up. And this, you know, about 10 years ago, I met this great looking, great, great looking girl. Everything else was everything I wanted. And then when we finally got down to discussing the nuts and the bolts, right, she tells me that she's a vegetarian. Well, that's okay by me, but I have one side of the family that's been cattle ranching out in Saskatchewan since the earth cooled. And I grew up with my, uh, my uh, maternal grandfather who, uh, who ranched just south of Edmonton as well. So we, we went through the whole litany of, of going through, introducing her to my parents and stuff like that. But the, the, the big elephant in the room was my grandfather, right? And she had to meet him and how was he going to react? Because my grandfather bitched about everybody, right? You know, be it the, you know, the Hutterites that live next door, you know, the, you know, the vegans who are driving the price of cattle down, everything else, you know, the whole bit. So we finally go to have dinner at the farm. And, you know, my, my wife Lois dresses up, puts on some, some tight wranglers, walks in, flirts with my grandfather incessantly for the whole morning before dinner. Everything is going great, right? You know, he's happy, she's happy. So I'm thinking, I got this nailed. You know, this is great. I love this girl. Everything's going great. The family lovers, perfect. Now, one, one, one other fact I, I, I neglected to note. Lois was raised in the city. I don't think she saw dirt until she was maybe 14 or 15. Her father happened to have been, though, one of the the president of the Northern Alberta Dairy Pool at this thing. So I thought maybe a little bit would have rubbed off on her, you know. My, my now father-in-law had, had been a dairy farmer in the past, though she never lived on the farm, but I thought maybe by osmosis she might have learned something. This leads up to the next point. So we're going out and I'm going to give her a tour of the farm, right? You know, we're going to go out and see the tractors, doing it out. and at this point in time, my grandfather's next door neighbor was a really large dairy farmer and he's best friend. So my father, my grandfather and father, they fed veal calves every once in a while, right? So we walk out there and we go to the, the inside pen and she sees all these cute little Holstein calves running around. She walks into the pen and stuff and next thing you know, right, they're all over her. You know, these things have been hand fed forever and they're sucking on her fingers and all this kind of stuff and she's just thinking, this is the greatest. And then she turns to me and she goes, Greg, this is so wonderful. When do their mummies come home? <laughs> uh, that was, I guess you had to be in there. <laughs> anyway, so what I'm going to talk about today is hopefully a bit of, uh, I'm taking it back, I'm not going to go on the, you know, this is what you need to do for tax, this is what, you know, that, that sort of stuff, here's some tips, here's some traps. I'll leave that to you for your professionals. What I'm going to talk about today is kind of a little more of a big picture type topic on farm business planning. Like everybody plans for their business as well. One thing I'm going to talk today is about planning on the structure of your business and how that impacts you as producers and how it can save you money, how it can uh, kind of roll in as we, the, the next term we call of course succession as well of the business. So I'm going to talk, kind of break it up today just so I can start and, and just have a bit of how I'm going to spend my time how many uh, producers here who are in here, how many of you guys farm in a corporation? Just so I have an idea. Uh, partnerships. Okay, is anybody still farming down here as a sole proprietor? Like personally? Not many, okay. Uh, a little different up north where we usually get a little more to the, uh, to the uh, partnership and uh, sole proprietor side. So uh, I'll, I'm gonna, hopefully gloss over the incorporation and, and other stuff quite quickly. But uh, 
What I'm going to talk about uh, secondly is the capital gains deduction, land rollovers, because uh, sometimes this gets lost in the mix when you're talking to your professionals. A uh, quick over about deferrals and, and why incorporate. And then I'm going to just talk about uh, a few little, uh, just sort of some case studies on where you might be in the, in the life cycle of what I call the farm, uh, of the farm and how that meshes up to uh, the type of corporate structure you can be using and what the benefits are. So uh, everything I'm going to talk about is going to be general in nature. You've got, there's a lot of technical issues you've got to look at. You know, don't proceed without talking and you know, getting some professional advice from your lawyer and your accountant. Okay. So I, I look at farm business planning kind of on a general point of view of there's a, a number of different issues. You have operational transfers, right, okay, between the family, you know, control of the farm, the management of the operation. The one thing that we see in farm business planning that's a little different is also we have wealth transfers, right, because in air, in, invariably we're going to be putting down land, machinery, inventory to the next generation as well when we're looking at business planning, bringing in the next generation. So key I find is that farm business planning's not just entail management and control of the operation, but it's also going to entail the transfer of wealth from one generation down to the other, okay? And this is different from non-farm enterprises, right? Big thing, we have high land values, right? So, and a minimal return on investment. You don't see a whole lot of farming operations earning, you know, 30, 40% on, uh, on returned capital like you may in the oil patch. And you have minimal sources of outside capital other than the bank, right, to finance a succession. How many people here have ever heard of a farm succession handling outside the farm, say with a key manager or something to that effect? Nobody here. I think in my career I've seen two. So again, a key different. I'm going to talk. I'm going to leave out of this the emotional issues, but. The big one that's always the big gorilla hanging in the room is also the family issues is too, right? When we're talking about how we manage the, or how we set up to manage the operation currently, and then how we look at the business succession in bringing in the next generation. So um, I, I, I tongue in cheek call this the planning cycle, okay? When, we, when I sit around and, and, and talk to clients, uh, I developed this a bit with Merle Good over from, uh, from Alberta Agriculture, you know, over quite a few beers. But I always start parents at age 40, right? And they're worried about getting ownership of the farm from their parents, how to pay down debt, you know, where's the cash coming from and how to finance their living costs, right? And first thing is son, right? And, oops. and uh, when son comes in, he's starting to think about what's the first thing he wants, of course, is, is the three-quarter ton 4x4 four four GMC, right? He's looking at school, career, girlfriend. So you don't have a, and I guess what I really want to talk about is you don't have a congruence of goals here happening at any point in the time of the cycle, right? You're getting into the transition zone. Parents are getting into their 50s and now son's starting to come into the operation or daughter coming into the operation for, you know, in terms of uh, being involved. So again, control is consistent, ownership, Big key is, of course, when you've got this, is now the daughter-in-law is coming into the force, right? In, in terms of mom and dad. Son is, he's now starting to see the same things mom and dad saw when he was 40. He's looking at the management struggle with dad, his living costs, and who else wants the farm, right? God forbid the brother-in-law wants to come in as well too, right? Transition zone, parents hit their 60s. You're looking at retirement estate planning, trying to consolidate the operation. Sons in his 40s, now you get his grandson coming in, okay, the same sort of thing. And then in the 70s, that's when it comes full circle, right? Because, you know, Pops hit 70s, he wants to retire, go down to Yuma, so what does he want? The 4x4 truck to pull the fifth wheel, right? Yet, um, you know, the, the key that comes in in this sort of the life cycle is siblings, okay? Son's in the 50s, he's been in the operation for 20 years, he thinks it's his, right? Mom and dad don't always necessarily agree, they're looking to split their wealth among uh, you know, the number of siblings who may have not contributed to the farming operation in the business, and the grandson's got the same thing. 
So I, I look to this, I call it the, the, a real puzzle in the, in the family farm, but I, when you call it the business or career of farming, I look to a few different kind of what I call bubbles, okay? And I, I, I tend to think in my sort of planning when I talk to, to clients, to kind of look at something a little differently in terms of what you have. I, so this is what I talk to is first the operating assets. This is your equipment inventory, uh, you know, your, your, your cattle herd, be it if you're, in, if you're in that side. And to me, this is the business of farming, okay? And that is different from wealth, which is on this side, okay? Your personal wealth, which is your land and your off-farm assets. This barely creates a return, right? That's barely going to give somebody a lifestyle. So to try to, in the succession planning, use these assets or to split those assets between the, the farming and the off-farm children is going to be tough. I look at this as this stays together and hopefully goes down to that, the farming son or daughter and that's what you, it's utilizing to, to make them a living, right? Because that's barely what it'll do. Here, of course, is the difference is in terms of wealth. We're going to have our off-farm assets, right? Insurance, RRSPs, and investments. But in most farming operations, that's pretty minimal when we're looking at an estate plan or an accession plan. Where's all the value and where's all your wealth, right? It's in this bubble here, right? The land, okay? And if you get nothing out of my talk today, is that when you're sitting down with your professionals and you're talking about a business plan for the farm, an estate plan for the farm and bringing up the next generation, is to separate the business of farming from the wealth, okay? This I can split, right? This can go to the off-farm kids, that sort of stuff. We can transfer land to them. We can make that go. Because at the end of the whole day, I know a whole bunch of guys that make a damn good living farming hardly own any land, right? In terms of that, we're going to see that go increase as we go to the next generation, as we have one more generation of, of Alberta off the farm that is inheriting land, right? There's, from my understanding is, you know, they seem to about like 60% of the land in the next 12 years is going to go through an ownership cycle as it, be, as it gets inherited from one generation to the other. So, and this will be kind of the key of what I talk about today when you're looking at what I call the business structure going forward is to separate it into the business and the wealth and go forward from there. And if there's any questions you guys have, I, I do way better just talking off my feet than I do uh, actually presenting something. So if you want to, if you have a question as ever as we're going through, just throw your hand up, don't hesitate to ask. So quickly, let's talk about what makes land or farming business succession differing from non-farming business. Because I do both, right? I do a lot of purchase, I, I do a lot in the oil patch because it's Alberta. And I still do a, a lot of planning in the agriculture area. Most of my clients are lawyers and accountants who are in small centers, in rural centers in Alberta, and, I, and, and so I do a lot of, I still do a lot of farm estate planning. The biggest key is, of course, in this, land is a primary asset, okay? So there's two things you have to realize from there when we differentiate this from what I'd call the other, the other industries in Alberta. First, market value of land, right, may not relate to productive capacity, okay? If you farm 50 miles off of Highway 2, your fair market value of your land is not determined by what it grows, right? It's determined by what some guy will pay for it in the oil patch to have a, to have a quarter section so he can park his RV, his quads, and, and his snowmobile trailer, right? And keep a couple horses for the wife and the kids. So that's key because <laughs> That's where it goes to, because that's where it goes to that wealth bubble I talked about. No deduction to the operator for the tax cost of land. Okay, this is another key difference, right? You don't get to depreciate land. Okay, whereas everybody else in in uh, in, in their industries, if I'm buying oil patch equipment, if I'm buying buildings, if I'm a manufacturer, that sort of stuff. Land is a very small component. Everything else I get to depreciate, okay? So they're paying in after tax, in before tax dollars to pay off their debt, 
that they've incurred to buy that capital asset, right? If it's land and you can't depreciate it, you're paying in after-tax dollars. So that's another key differential. Cash basis accounting, okay, is another what I find huge difference in, in the difference in turning of business planning and succession planning with farming, okay? You've got inventory issues because, of course, you can deduct inventory. I'm just going to stay away from that speaker for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, mandatory and optional inventory issues. What it does give rise to, of course, is deferrals, right? And which you don't get in any other industry. Farming, though, okay, the big game, right? I'm not paying tax. So I'm buying at the end of the year to defer tax into the next year. So I'm going to talk about that from an operational point of view and how that impacts. Because uh, that'll apply to anybody that's sitting here, how do you, if you farm in a corporation personally or whatever. This is the key. And another one that makes farm succession planning different is the last one, low return on capital to fund buyout. I've got buddies who are in the oil patch running trucks. If they don't make a 30% return on their investment any year, they are not interested, right? They won't go buy that iron, okay? Who's made 30% in here per year buying land and farming it? Who's made 2%? One and a half, right? That's where you're in. Return on capital right now in farming assets between one and a half to 2.75% per year, and that's on the high end, right? Very low return. So we can't utilize that, that really it's tough in terms of that wealth transfer that I've talked about to create enough income to buy it off, right? So again, so all of those make farming succession, farming business planning extremely uh, different from other industries. But, yes? Yeah, the, you need to value your land when the management role changes, you freeze it and start paying it off then. Then, it's, then it is payable. Other siblings are compensated because you paid the owning generation for 20 years and paid it off. Instead of valuing it towards the end of that, saying, well, we can roll it tax-free, so we don't want to transfer the asset. We want to transfer it then, which doesn't make any sense. No other business operates that way. So I think the, the question or the, or the comment here is to think about how you value and when you value that property. And that's where I go back to land, that's where I go back to wealth versus management myself. Yeah, and, but I, the, the other side of it, you know, I, and I've had this conversation before with other guys is that, well, really the key driver to the, to, the key driver to increase in land values has nothing to do with its farming capacity, right? I, I would agree if you're paying off debt, it's one thing, but the key drive, but the increase of the, the, the other side, or the other argument when you're sitting around with, you know, seven children around the table is that, well, the land's not going up because Johnny's sitting there farming it. The land's going up because land in Alberta is just going up, okay? But I, we can, I, I, just a counterpoint to that, to that comment. But on the upside, in farming, what you do have is the ability to get those assets, as they've talked about, on a rollover to the next generation on a non-taxable basis, right? Any other industries, you're going to, that capital, that inherent capital gain on death is going to get uh, realized as soon as somebody dies. But for, uh, for uh, the farming business, biggest difference is we got rollovers available to transfer that property down and a very much more expansive capital gain deduction for land than is available to non-farmers. So this is, I, I get more questions on the capital gains deduction than anything else, okay? And these guys start to retire, they start thinking about it, or as they're starting to hive off land and sell quarters or something to that effect, this is to the forefront. And to be honest, in the professional community, uh, your accountants, they, this is not understood as well as it should be, okay? But it's very expansive. You know, there's other, there's, and guys talk about triggering it prior to death. 
sale to spouse, corporation, or partnership because of the worry that the government will take it away. Okay, if you want my two cents, this is the, the capital gains deduction is never going to go away. Okay, it, it'll be there for if, if it didn't disappear back in 92, it is never going to disappear from now. So this, you may hear about stuff about crystallizing the capital gains deduction, that sort of stuff, forget about it. It's never going to go away. If it does, they'll give you some sort of uh, treatment where you'll be able to trigger it at that point in time. Don't worry about it. Now, this is the key, I, I, so I, I'm going to try to talk about this simply, but in terms of the capital gains deduction, who can we what qualify at the land? Because at the end of the whole day, somebody's got to meet this test under the act called the gross revenue test, okay? That the land itself, somebody, in a, somebody has had to meet this test that their gross revenue from farming has to exceed net income from all their other sources. If you meet that test for 24 months, the land is qualified for the capital gains deduction, basically. Now, what can happen, and what I want to point out to, is the person who's selling the land, they can look back to their great-grandfather. If anybody in that side of the lineal chain met the test, it qualifies in their hands to sell. And, and get the 750 tax free. They can look down the chain to their great grandchild. If they've farmed it and met the test, it qualifies back to them. So even if the seller has never farmed the land, or even stepped on it for that matter, okay, they can look back to a gross revenue test up their lineal chain and down their lineal chain. And if everybody's met it, and if anybody has met that 24 month test, gross revenue from farming exceeds net income from all other sources, it qualifies in their hands. Okay, so as we see a transfer of land from the primary producers down to their children who are now off farm, and again, down to grandchildren, et cetera, that are off farm, we can still use this capital gains deduction to shelter gains that would have been realized on sales to third parties or even between uh, between family members. So this is a key, extremely expansive, but what it does do is keep your largest asset, your largest wealth bubble away from the tax man because of this very large expansive test, okay? So that's key, okay? If you give the land to somebody, if I give the land to the kid, even though they never farm it, if they turn around and sell it, they'll still realize the capital gains deduction or can realize it in those situations. Not well understood in the professional community, okay? Uh, so key yet, non-farming children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren can still qualify for the capital gains deduction. Um, just as a bit of a side issue, there's a, actually on, I, I, I did some consulting for some, uh, some clients that had a, a, a parcel of land that was underneath, that was a, that was a, on 149th Street in Edmonton. It's a new, it, it was a commercial block on there, and they actually knocked down the building, and uh, it was still owned in a partnership between the siblings. That they had got the land from their great grandfather uh, back in the 1920s, who had farmed it. And we figured out that it still qualified for the capital gains deduction, even though there had though been a, a, a professional building on it for close to 50 years. So that's kind of like one outlier, but again, shows the breadth of tax policy. <clears throat> Transferring the land to the children, you've heard about what we call maybe the rollover. Okay, so the rollover, as, we, uh, as I'll describe it, is this is enabling an individual to transfer property to the next generation to a child at their tax cost, so no capital gain is realized when, that's, when there's a transfer. Any other time if you make a gift of property to a child, okay, you're deemed to have realized any capital gain that may be accrued on that up to the time when you, when you gifted it. With farmland, you can gift it, of course, to the next generation, and any deferred gain that's in there, the excess of uh, its fair market value over the cost, you don't have to realize. You can roll it over to the next generation. And kind of some key points from there as a producer you should uh, realize. Okay, so children don't have to be farming it at the time of the transfer. As long as it was what I'll call pr used principally in the business of farming 
by the landowner or their spouse or child, you can transfer it to the next generation on a tax deferred basis. And it does not have to be actively farmed at the time of transfer. So of course what happens is as guys start to retire, the land may not be utilized in a farming business anymore. You know, their estate plan is gonna sell it when they die, but it's been rented out for the last little while. Um, that will still qualify for the rollover. And I'm just gonna go through a bit of an example here. So a lot of guys get really worried about this. I'm not farming the land anymore, but I still wanna get it down to the kids and not realize the capital gain. Can I still do it? Yes. The land has to be used what's called, uh, for the, to meet the rollover, land has to be used what's called principally used in the business of farming. And I think if I step to the front here, I can not hit, no, it still doesn't like me. Okay, Revenue Canada says principally used means more than 50%. And the courts have said, well, that's both a time and percentage of use test, okay? So the example is, let's say it's been farmed from 1966 to 1986, 20 years, and rented out from 1986 to 2004. If it was transferred in 2004, because it was farmed more than rented out, it will qualify as principally used. If we, if we get over this, let's say it's been farmed for 20 and rented for 23, it's no longer principally used in the business of farming. Therefore, it can't be rolled over to the children, okay? Unless you re-meet the test. The other test is if it's used in the year, it will also qualify. So there are some tricks to get around, but again, this principle used is another issue that arises when we have land going from production into rental, okay? And we want to, and as part of our estate plan, still want to pass it down to our children or our grandchildren, et cetera, on a tax deferred basis, okay? Any questions up to now? Are you talking a crop share or rental compared to a cash rent basis? Does that make any difference? Uh, question here was crop share or rental versus a, uh, a cash rental basis on whether or not it qualifies in the business. Good question. Um, the CRA used to have a historical position that crop sharing was just that. Land, land rent, you weren't no longer in the business, okay? However, that's been modified over about the last seven years, I'd say, through a couple of court cases and, and some, differ, and some uh, differing Revenue Canada technical interpretations. My position is this. If you're in a crop share arrangement, but you have some liability for the expenses, okay, that would be looked at more as a joint venture, and therefore the income from that, quote, rental is income from the business of farming, okay? So you're getting a percentage of the crop, you also, if you incur a percentage of the expenses and are liable for those expenses, that will be more akin to a joint venture and in the business, okay? If it's your standard, if it's the standard, if it's the other side of the coin, or at this end of the, of the thing where the, 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 the renter is paying all the expenses, you have no liability for those inputs or anything to that effect, and all your, you know, basically all you're liable for is maybe the, uh, uh, the property taxes that's gonna be looked more as income from property and therefore not in the business of farming at that point, okay? That answer your question? Okay, so I kinda look this, if you've got, if you got uh, some liability for the input costs and you're getting a share of the crop, more like a joint venture in the farming business, okay? So what I'm gonna talk about here is uh, going to what I call the issue identification tree, I'm about halfway through, and this is what I call the life cycle of the farming business, okay, and how it is structured, okay? And I'm gonna talk about a, a few different issues that, that happen up, but basically, farming's a little different than, than other uh, businesses as well, too. You know, usually if you're in the oil patch, if you're in, you know, doing retail, you know, that sort of the service industry, what's the first thing you do when you go into business, right? You start a corporation and you go ahead. That's not necessarily the way it works in farming, okay? Usually you, you see a progression from a guy who'll be a sole proprietor for a while. You know, he may look then to incorporate going into a partnership with spouse, kids, etc. But what I'm gonna do here is kind of take a look at the different, what I call life cycles of going through this and what are some of the issues that arise and when does it make sense to go into different sorts of structures. Overwhelmingly, you guys here today, 
it's been down in here, you're in partnership, or farming in a company. So what I'm going to do is kind of go through this stuff fairly quickly, but talk about when does it make sense to go from a partnership into a corporation structure, when I'm farming personally in a partnership, to go into a corporate structure, or if I'm in a corporation, when does it make sense to go into multiple corporations, okay? And I'm gonna talk about each of those different uh, kind of what I call life cycles in the, in the, in the business to, and to try to coordinate your structure with that, okay? So when I'm a proprietor, and uh, this will lead into deferrals and stuff to that a bit, when does it make sense to go into a corporation and when does it make sense to go into a partnership, okay? So if I'm sitting here farming my own, this is where the key issue I always find is going into a company is if debt payment is critical, right? You're starting up the business or it's expanding and what are you doing? You're incurring debt to buy capital assets, okay? And usually this is where the rubber hits the road where on the expansion when the proprietor looks to go into a corporation when he wants to start paying off that debt at the least tax cost, right? Or if he's been deferring and he's got the large de hidden deferrals that need to be tax paid now, he's starting to unwind those, how do I do those at the least tax cost, okay? So why do you want to incorporate, okay? As I talked about before, one of the big business reasons is, is limited liability, right? If I have a corporation and it's carrying on the business, somebody wants to sue me, they sue the company, they don't sue me personally as a shareholder, right? That's called limited liability and how it works. You know, generally in practice, it's only the slip and fall litigation risk that's minimized, right? Because, you know, if I'm farming in a company, what's the first thing that the bank asks for when I go to get my bank loan, right? Personal guarantee, yeah. <laughs> and second reason for incorporating, especially in Alberta, land of the free and home of the brave, is tax rates, right? So if we take a look at the highest corporate at the, at the, in a company, the highest tax rate in Alberta, it's 13.5% for the first half million dollars of income that I earn, okay, if it's in a company. After that, 25%. With a individual, of course, I pay up to about my first 100,000 at 30%. Anything over that, we're paying about 39 to 43.7. So a corporate, at the end of the whole day, a corporation is going to be able to pay off debt, okay, in about two thirds the time that if somebody pays those tax rates as an individual, okay? So that's key. Incorporating makes sense if I have to start, if I'm expanding, acquiring more assets, and are using debt to finance those things. I'm a farmer, why should I pay tax, right? I think my, my, my great grandfather, he didn't pay, ta I don't think he paid tax you know, until he quit farming in 86, then he managed to defer it onto me, okay? And I'm paying his tax bill. <laughs> but if you are buying land, as I said before, someone has to pay tax on that income to, to, to pay down the principal. Key, I don't get to depreciate land, right? So I don't have that capital cost allowance to reduce my income in order to shelter my cash flow on the payment of principal payments on debt, okay? I gotta pay tax on it and use those after-tax dollars to pay down the debt for land. Okay, or else you get on what I call the deferral treadmill. And this applies to corporate farms as well as to, uh, as to uh, uh, proprietors and, and partnerships. So let's talk about that, right? I, as a farmer, can cash basis accounting, I, at the end of the year, if I have income, I can buy inventory, of course, and deduct that to offset my income. So let's say in year one, I've got income of 75,000. And I go out and I buy inventory, borrow the money from, the, from my local bank to go out, buy that, buy that inventory, offset it, don't pay any tax. Year two, I do the same thing. Year three, I do the same thing. So what's my result? You can see I've, uh, I've uh, successfully deferred $225,000 of income, okay? My borrowing over that time has gone up because I've used this $75,000 to live on every year, right, for my cash flow. And my total tax liability keeps on going up, okay? So a deferral is what I call a hidden hit to your equity. Now, this could be my conclusion is paying tax is good, right? It means you're making money. 
You know, somebody's got to do it. And what's also relevant, I think, is do a tax balance sheet, okay? And I'm just going to talk about that quickly. If we take a look at just my example there, I've got inventory now at my December 31 year end of $225,000. My liability on the other side, though, is 225, right? I keep on borrowing at the end of the year from the bank to buy enough in, uh, inventory to offset all these income inclusions I've had. Well, what's the other side of the ledger, right? If I got to start unwinding this whole thing, I got tax, if I turned around and sell it tomorrow, about 90 grand. This is what we call an underwater asset, right? If I sell it, I'm worse off, okay? By the time I pay off the bank loan and pay off the tax. And the cash to pay the tax is gonna have to come from some other equity. So deferrals in and of themselves, you, you gotta be careful of because you might get like we call this deferral treadmill. And a lot of planning I do on incorporating guys or utilizing other, car, uh, or using companies uh, to, uh, uh, to shift tax burdens is to get away from this issue, okay? When you built up this deferral and now you want to start tax paying it and get off it. Now, this is the other key. Is a deferral really bad for you, right? And you gotta, you gotta outline your, you, you gotta exchange what I'd call the business risk for the tax risk on these sorts of things. Business risk versus actually a deferral is a pretty good low cost financing rate from the government of Alberta if you take a, or, or, and, uh, the, and the feds. So let's assume, <laughs> you can tell I did this a little while ago, a 10% interest cost because it just makes the numbers easier and I'm really bad with numbers, okay? So we're gonna take a 10% interest cost and a 10% return on that tax, okay? So cost of my deferral, $225,000, say I pay 10% interest on it, but I'm only holding that for what, two months, right? I know, I'll get to that. So my cost is 3,750 bucks, okay? But my opportunity cost, if I paid those taxes and I no longer have that cash in the bank or, or working for it, right? 10% for the year is 8,725 bucks. So actually I'm cash ahead by deferring, right? Because really my money's out only for a couple of months. And I'm just gonna talk to you Ed about that. On the deferral, what are the concerns, okay? So I've got a business risk of holding inventory, okay? Now, what I talked about the 60 days is, CRA's position is if I've acquired inventory and offset that, I have to hold that for a minimum of 60 days. So grain in the bin, cattle in the lot, you know, inputs at the, uh, from UFA, that sort of stuff. I have to have a 60 day hold at a minimum before I go around and sell those things again to qualify as, quote, inventory and therefore be deductible. So you got your business risk of holding over that 60 days, right? Price risk. What happens to feed your cattle in, uh, at the beginning of December, right? Prices shoot up, right? Why? Because everybody's got a frickin' December 31 year end in farming, right? And we're, uh, everybody's out there buying these things to drive, and it drives the price up. Simple so supply and demand, right? So you got price risk over that 60 days that it starts to go down. I've bought, prices are now going down. Everybody involved in buying at the same time. You're gonna have a guaranteed loss because everybody 30 days, February 1 is starting to, st everybody out is starting to sell, right? To get off the treadmill. So again, big concern on the deferral just as is, is your business risk and holding through that 60 day period, especially if you're on the same year end as everybody else. So tip, if I ever want to, if I ever want to incorporate, what can I do? Do I have to have a December 31 year end? No, right? Go to an October, okay? Go to a May one. That that sort of stuff, you know, really helps out if you're if you're in this cycle. A deferral, though, as what I'd call a management practice, also asks as income averaging into a lost year. The Income Tax Act used to have for farmers. Farmers were the last one to have it, right? Five-year income averaging, right? Instead of having the big swings year from another, I was allowed to, if I had a lot, you know, if I had an income year and a lost year, I was allowed to average those over five on a go-forward basis to kind of average out the tax I was paying, right? Because we have a progressive tax system in Canada, higher my income gets, the higher tax rates I pay, right? Now, a deferral, though, will act as a, 
as you can use it as an income averaging into a loss year. So let's say I have operating income in year one of 200,000 and I defer 100 by buying inventory at the end of that year. Well, this isn't a bad thing because if the next year, right, if I have a wreck, okay, and I bring that deferral into income, I've really done an averaging using, using the, uh, the, the buying and selling of inventory to average that income over two years and reduce my tax rate. So from an, another plus on the deferral is that from that sort of side can act as an income averaging. So um, kind of some key points on year-end deferrals. If you're, if you're into the game, you have to have possession of that inventory, physical possession, okay? That doesn't mean that they have to be on your, for the, the cattle can still be on the lot, but you have to have physical possession of the inventory at risk, right? You have to be, if it's uh, in the bin or if, if it's in the bin in Vancouver, you have to be paying the insurance on that, et cetera. You have to have a risk of loss and a chance of, and a, and a chance of gain, okay, on, on that inventory. You can't be into one of these situations where there's a guaranteed return, right? Nielsen Brothers used to be great for this, right? End of the year, you give them 100 grand. Come, amazingly enough, those cattle prices rose just enough back in January or February that you made two or 3% on your money. Time, year after year after year. My grandfather was great at that. But again, you actually, but basically that's just a money lending arrangement. Revenue went after those pretty hard a few years ago. You have to have physical, uh, uh, along with physical possession, you also have to have price risk as well, okay? And there also should be a tie to the present farming business. We're seeing, all right, uh, up until about two years ago, I saw a lot of the CRA. If you were in grain farming and dabbling in Canada and cattle just over the year end, they were denying that, saying that that was a separate business and not related to your farming business, and therefore we're not allowing the deduction. So again, uh, a few key points on deferrals, okay? Question. Feeder association cattle, uh, the question is where do feeder association cattle fit into that scenario? Well, you still have risk on, the, like I don't, I don't see, really the feeder association is just a lending, or at, at its basis is a lending arrangement, so right? Can you claim those cattle as a deduction? Yes, you can. Like you, even, though they're not e even though you're not, they're not brand, I guess the question is, is they're not your brand or they still hold the feeder association brand on those. We've done about eight or nine uh, disputes on that and uh, revenue has finally turned the tide on that. It, it, usually if you get, I, I find what happens if you get a new auditor that looks at a farm and he sees this feeder association stuff, he doesn't understand it. As soon as he goes up to a superior or something and gets explained to him how it works, they, that the issue usually goes away. But yes, even though you may, they have a feeder association brand and for quote legal purposes, title doesn't transfer, Really, at the end of a whole day, it's just a, it's just a financing arrangement. You have the risk of loss on those on those animals. So, yeah, they will. You should be allowed a deduction on the acquisition of those at the end of the year. Yeah. So, uh, quickly, other reasons to incorporate. Um, I'll, I'll go through this quick. Choosing an off calendar, December 31 year end. You get off the buying cycle that everybody else is in, and. Uh, that's it. I only got 15 minutes. So the proprietorship to the partnership, I'm not going to talk about here. Um, if you guys want, if those who have that issue, uh, we can uh, we can grab my card over the break and I can give you some of this. But I think what I want to do now is talk about corporations into multiple corporations because this is going to be a big issue. This is a bigger issue, and you guys are. What I find is down south, you guys are like about 50 years ahead of management than they are up north when it comes to the farming businesses, right? Because guys started back here back in the 50s and 60s and incorporating, whereas up north, nobody gave a damn until about the 90s because nobody made any money up there, right? Hard scrabbling on everything. So what I'm going to talk about now is a, is a key concern for an estate planning side on when do I go from a partnership to a corporation or when do I go to a corporation into multiple corporations, okay? And I'll quickly go through the incorporation of the partnership. 
This one's a, what I call the real deal. This, this lets you guys use your capital gains deduction to get a tax paid shareholder's loan back from your company that you can withdraw a tax, you can withdraw a tax free. Now, I'll tell you this. If I could do this in the oil patch, I could have successfully retired about 10 years ago, okay? To basically make shareholders loans out of nothing, okay? And tax pay them. Um, so it, it is one of the key differentials of, of farming. So uh, in use of the capital gains deduction. So if I've got a farming partnership, so let's just go with this, Mr. and Mrs. X has a fair value of about two million and each still has their capital gains deduction available. I do a lot of structures where I have a farming partnership that's carrying on the business of farming and land holdings outside of the partnership. So the general way to do this is we incorporate a company, they transfer their partnership interests uh, to that company under what we call section 85 of the act, uh, lets you defer a tax deferred rollover, but it also lets you elect to trigger some tax. And in this case, we're gonna trigger the tax and, and take back a promissory note of 750 equal to their capital gains deduction. And at the end of the whole day, they each have these shares in the company, and, but they have these big tax paid deferred notes, okay? And that's tax paid back from the company. The key here is then we wind up the partnership. Now, if they had sold when it was a partnership, they would have paid personal tax rates when they sold inventory or recapture on equipment. In this case, once we get into the company, they're paying tax at what? First 500 at 13 and a half percent, okay? Once we've paid that at 13 and a half percent inside of the company, we can start paying off these notes on a tax paid basis. So at the end of the whole day, instead of paying 39 percent, what, what I would have is I, if I liquidated the farming business, now by transferring my partnership in, creating these big shareholder loans, I'm basically paying tax at 13 and a half, okay? So it, it's a, a key point to think about, you, you hear a lot of the, of the advisors telling you or doing this, this is the reason why. I'm converting 13 and a half percent, I'm converting 39 point tax into 13 and a half percent tax, okay? By, by use of this. And I said, if I could do this in the oil patch by using guys' capital gains deduction to create a, cap, to create a shareholder's loan in a company, like I say, I would have been hailed as the second coming of the Messiah in some places. But uh, so I'm not going to go through the, the key issues, but here, if you take a look at the tax, the corporation the, to the partnership to pay off the 750 to get 1500 personally, you're paying total tax of 235,000. To get the same amount into your genes individually, you're paying $758,000 of tax at 39 points. That's the big difference. Now, I got 10 minutes left. For those that are in farming in a corporation, okay? How many here, own, so of those guys who are in corporation, how many guys have land inside of their company? How many have all their land outside of their company? One or two, perfect, okay. Now, this is another little thing of mine, okay? A lot of advisors out there get into this headspace that you got to keep your land out, right? They always say, well, it's easier to transfer, you can use the rollover, everything else. Keep the land out of your company, okay? And I sit there and say, why? Why, what happens if I have the land outside? Well, I, I got to pay two levels of tax now, right? To pay down the principal if I've gone out to buy it. First of all, I got to pay the corporate tax from my business operations, which are in the company. Then I've got to pay that distribution tax as a dividend or salary or whatever to myself personally and pay a second level of tax to pay down the bank for the land I just bought, right? All for what purpose? Well, but then you can give it to your kids easier than you could with a corporation. Well, use two corporations, okay? And I'll talk to you about this. The big inherent benefit of being in a corporation, of course, is I pay tax at one level, 13.5%, use those funds, pay down the bank. 
or if I don't have bank debt anymore, pay tax at 13 and percent, whatever's left over, I keep in the company, right? That's the inherent benefit of having a company. So one way of getting around this whole issue of, well, now I've got an operating company with land in it, but I want to give my off-farm kids the land, I want to give my, my on-farm kid the op business operations, how do I do it? Pretty easy, multiple corporations, okay? So we can do this, the two big issues from going to a single company to multiple companies in the farming basis are spin out land for later sale or transfer, or if you start to get to that point where you're no longer paying debt and you're starting to accumulate, you know, off what I call the off farm assets, investment assets, is to spin those out to keep your company pure so mom and dad can take investment company and retire with that and son can take farming company and go farming down the road, okay? So we can do this all tax free. That's the big thing, okay? So let's say we've got, but I'm just gonna use this as an example where we've got Mr. and Mrs. X, let's say they've got land worth a million bucks in their company, equipment and inventory as well. So let's call this their old company. Now, they're gonna get an offer to, they're thinking in three or four years, they're gonna basically, instead of trying to pass this down to the kids, they're just gonna go the auction sale route, right? So if I sold the land inside of a company, I'd be paying tax at about 19%. Because the one thing a company doesn't have that an individual has for land sales is what? Company does not have the capital gains deduction, okay? You as an individual have the capital gains deduction. You do, a company does not on the sale of land. However, as an individual, I have the capital gains deduction available if I have shares in a qualifying small business corporations or a share of a family farm company or a partnership interest like I talked before. Now, if I was to counsel Mr. and Mrs. X though, selling an operating company is pretty much next to impossible, okay? And if I was gonna then sell the land to a third party, I'm gonna pay tax of about 200,000 on my proceeds of about 100. Do I have any alternatives? Yes. This is what we call breaking up, uh, I, this is what I call the Landco strategy. We're gonna have Mr. and Mrs. X incorporated company, Landco. Same shareholdings as before. We can use a special provision of the act called section 85 to transfer the land from Old Co to Land Co, okay? No tax is realized. Then we're gonna have them transfer a million bucks of shares of, of Old Co into Land Co, again under section 85, no tax. And they're gonna take back some shares of Land Co as, as, as payment. So you get into these weird little shareholdings that go back and forth. But then we have Landco buy back its shares that it issued to Old Co. We have Old Co buy back its shares that it issued to Landco, and they set each other off. And at the end of the whole day, you get into this structure. Mr. and Mrs. X, oh, sorry, Mr. and Mrs. X have Old Co with the inventory and machinery in it, worth a million bucks. They've also got Landco, and they've got these share, these half million dollars each of special preferred shares, but the land's in here. We got an operating company, we got a land company. So, as long as I do this a few years ahead of time, three is the magic number, I can then, Mr. and Mrs. X can sell Landco and realize their capital gains deduction. So, there's certain anti, what we call anti-avoidance provisions under the act called section 55. If we do this reorganization at least three years prior to selling Landco, we're fine, okay? The benefits are the land co shares qualify for the capital gains deduction. Second benefit, if I'm not worrying about selling the land, it separates the land from the operations for real estate planning, right? For estate planning. We go back to that wealth versus the business bubbles before. I've got my wealth being my land in one corporation, that's a different bubble. And I've got the business in another corporation, different bubble. And I can give those away differently. I do a lot of planning where now I've got the off-farm kids involved in land ownership and just being landlords, right? 
in their own company. I keep them away from the business operations where son, who's putting in the set sweat, or daughter, who's putting in the sweat equity and have uh, been involved in the business for a number of years, are now control of that corporation. Now, the other side of this coin is, well, Gartner, you just told me it's pretty impossible to sell, it's impossible to sell shares of an operating farm corporation. How am I going to sell shares of Landco? It's actually pretty easy, okay? Uh, let's say we got Mr. D then who wants to sell the land or wants to buy the land from Mr. and Mrs. X. If I sold it out of Landco, I'd realize tax of about $200,000. But we can do a little, uh, a little trick where Mr. D incorporates what we call Bygum, Bico. He puts in a million bucks. He buys the shares of Landco from Mr. and Mrs. X. They use their capital gains deduction. They're paid a million bucks. Now they've paid no tax. So they've realized on their capital gains deduction, got the, uh, the cash in their jeans, okay? Then we can do a, a little transaction where Mr. D winds up the land co into his buy co. There's a, spe a spe special provision of the act that lets us call bump the tax cost up to its fair what he paid for it. So now he's got land in buy co with a fair market value of a million and a tax cost of a million bucks. He's no worse off. He's bought shares, but he's been able to convert what he paid for the shares now into the tax cost of land, so he's no worse off. And he still owed the million bucks. If he wants the land personally, he can then transfer the land out of Bico into his name at a million bucks, no tax. So he's bought shares, everybody's better off. Mr. and Mrs. X, they've saved 200,000. Buyer is in no worse position, okay? And he's incurred costs 2,000, 3,000 bucks to set up the Bico bump and, and, and do it all. So basically, what should the cost of the shares of Landco be? Of course, discounted a bit off that million bucks because of the, of the uh, uh, requirement to wind up those companies. But again, uh, at the end of the whole day, pretty nominal to what the tax savings are. So I, if you get anything out of what I've talked about today in terms of being in the corporate sphere, okay, having land inside of a company makes good sense, okay? To me, you're using low tax rate dollars to pay off principal, okay? At the end of the whole day, there's a number of strategies to take that land out of that operating company and put it into a separate land company, okay? That you can either turn around and sell, if that's what the, the succession plan is gonna be, is the auction sale, or to use that separate land company to bring in the off-farm children, that wealth bubble, and establish your estate plan through that while taking the business and letting that go to the next generation free of, you know, kind of what I'd call the liabilities back out of, you know, to the rest of the family. So that's, uh, that's basically the end of my, my thing today. I'm sorry if I went a little quickly. I only had one hour. I'll be hanging around till about two or three, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to come up and ask me. All right. Thank you, you've been a great audience today. Mm.